we will now talk about a few miscellaneous topics related to cost of capital estimation. Here are the four items that we'll deal with. Estimating beta and determining project beta, country risk, marginal cost of capital schedule, and flotation costs. First, estimating beta and determining a project beta. A firm's beta is used to estimate its required return on equity. And we saw this in the CAPM formula where we said that the required return on equity is equal to the risk-free rate plus the beta times the expected return on market minus the risk-free rate. This was also called the equity risk premium or the market risk premium. The risk-free rate is based on the economy. The market risk premium or equity risk premium is also based on a given economy. The beta is a number that represents the particular stock and this represents the riskiness of the stock. Beta is a measure of risk. Riskier firms will have higher betas. When we use the term equity beta, then we are talking about the beta of the stock. This captures both financial risk as well as business risk. Business risk is the risk associated with the regular operations or business, i.e. the risk of sales not being as high as we expected or the risk of costs being higher than expected. Financial risk stems from the level of debt that a company has taken. Beta is estimated by regressing a stock's return with overall market returns. We will discuss beta in more detail when we cover portfolio management later in our course but very simplistically beta tells us about how a given stock price varies relative to the market and since beta deals with variations relative to the movements of the market we can calculate beta by doing a regression of a given stock's returns with the overall market returns this might seem a little complicated, but don't worry about it too much. This is material that you will see at level 2. At times, we need to estimate the beta for a company or project that is not publicly traded. And what we are going to do in this segment is talk about how we can calculate the beta for a company or project that is not publicly traded. So we don't have the stock price. We cannot compare movements in the stock price with the market, so what do we do? The answer is that we use a method called the pure play method, which will be discussed in detail on the next slide. But first, some basic terminology. To use the pure play method, we have to identify a comparable company. This comparable company would be a publicly traded company where we know the stock price and where we can come up with the beta. We'll see these terms also, equity beta and levered beta. Equity beta and levered beta are synonymous. These are the terms that we actually have been using over here. When we talk about the beta of a stock, we are really referring to the equity beta or the levered beta. Levered beta is the beta assuming that the company has some leverage. So the financial risk is also incorporated into the beta. Asset beta and unlevered beta are synonymous. This refers to the risk associated with purely the assets of a company. We assume that the company is unlevered and the riskiness of a company assuming no debt is called asset beta or unlevered beta. Now let's understand this method called the pure play method and we will do so by discussing an example. AA Corp is a large conglomerate and wants to determine the equity beta of its food division. This food division is not publicly traded. So how will we come up with the beta of the food division? That's what this slide is all about. This division has a debt to equity ratio of 0.8. 7. This ratio gives us a sense for how much debt the division has taken or what is the leverage of this division. The tax rate is 
A comparable publicly traded food company has a equity beta of 1.2 and a debt to equity ratio of 0.5. Not explicitly stated here, but let's assume that the tax rate here is also 40%. What is the equity beta of AA's food division? There are three steps that you need to follow. The first step is identify a comparable publicly traded company and estimate its beta. This is an important step in the real world, but in the exam world, this information will typically be given to you as it has been given over here. We are told that this comparable company has an equity beta of 1.2, so step 1 is done for you. Then you determine the comparables asset beta, which is also the unlevered beta. First, I'll tell you conceptually what we are doing over here. We know that the equity beta of the company is 1.2. This is a number that incorporates the fact that the company has debt. What we need to ask is, what is the asset beta or what is the beta of this comparable company if it had no debt? And we come up with that number, the asset beta or the unlevered beta using this formula. And this is the formula you need to memorize. The asset beta is equal to the equity beta, which is 1.2, multiplied by 1 over 1 plus 1 minus the tax rate, that is 0 0.6, multiplied by the debt to equity ratio. This is the debt to equity ratio of the comparable company, which is 0 0.5. When you do the calculation, you should come up with 0 0.92. This is the asset beta of the comparable. It represents the riskiness, assuming there is no debt. We can assume that the food division of AA Corp has the same business risk as the business risk of the comparable. We can therefore say that the asset beta of the food division is also 0 0.92. But now we need to account for the fact that the food division has a debt to equity ratio of 0.7. We need to calculate the equity beta or the levered beta. And the formula is given over here. The levered beta is equal to the asset beta, which is 0 0.92 multiplied by 1 plus the tax rate or 1 minus the tax rate which is 0 0.6 times the debt to equity ratio which is 0 0.7 you do the calculation and you should get 1.3 and it should make sense that the equity or levered beta for the food division is higher than the equity beta of the comparable because the food division has more debt it has a higher debt to equity ratio more debt means more risk and more risk means that it should have a higher beta while not explicitly asked in this question but you can now use this beta number to calculate the required return for the food division and you would use capm for that you could use the required return is equal to the risk free rate plus the beta which is 1.3 multiplied by the equity risk premium. Now I want you to do examples 9, 10 and 11. Some of these are a little long, but if you have understood the concepts discussed here, you should be able to do the examples. Next item, country risk. For companies in developing countries, we need to add a country risk premium to cap M. Most of the discussion so far has been from the perspective of an investor in a developed market. If you are a US-based investor and you are investing in an American company, then you can simply use the capital asset pricing model, which we have discussed. Required return is equal to risk-free rate plus beta into equity risk premium. You use this to come up with your required return. But what if you are investing in a developing country like India? Then there is risk involved associated with the developing country. 
and you need to add a premium for that risk that is called the country risk premium notice that the formula that we have here is very similar to the regular capm formula the only difference is this country risk premium just to give you a simple example now if you are a us based investor you would use the us based risk free rate let's say that is 3% and then let's say that the beta of a given stock is 1.5 you would have the expected return on the market minus the risk free rate let's say that this premium is 6% and let's say that the country risk premium associated with india is 3% you would plug that number in and do your calculations don't get too hung up on this the high level concept is what is needed over here i think the probability of being tested on this is relatively low the next question is how do we calculate the country risk premium the country risk premium is given by the sovereign yield spread multiplied by something which i will talk about in a moment but first let's understand the sovereign yield spread the sovereign yield spread is a measure of the riskiness of a given country sovereign means national or country yield spread means the differences between two yields so let's understand the definition sovereign yield spread is equal to the developing country government bond yield let's say a developing country is india and india has issued government bonds denominated in us dollars and let's say that the yield on those bonds is 7% we are looking at a spread so this needs to be a difference we then subtract the yield on the developing country bond let's say a comparable maturity us bond issued by the us government has a yield of 3% then the sovereign yield spread is 7 minus 3 which is 4% this 4% gives us a measure of the risk associated with investing in india but notice the 4% is purely based on investing in the government bond market what if we are investing in the stock market we then need to account for the risk associated with the stock market and that's where this next term comes in this next term is equal to the annualized standard deviation of the equity index of the developing country so let's take let's continue with our india example and we take a major equity index in india and look at the standard deviation of returns of that index so standard deviation of the equity index in india divided by the annualized standard deviation of the sovereign bond market in terms of the developed market country so you divide by the standard deviation of the bond market this would be the bond market in india this term tells us about the relative riskiness of the stock market when you combine the two the riskiness of the bond market in india and the riskiness of the stock market we come up with the country risk premium just as a disclaimer here this method is not a method that you will see in every single textbook when you study country risk premium from different books you might see slightly different formulas don't worry about it too much in terms of your cfa level 1 exam this is what you need to use and again understanding the concept is more important than understanding the details that we have discussed over here to understand this concept a little better make sure you do example 12 coming now to the marginal cost of capital schedule and i will explain this concept through an example a company's capital target structure is 60% equity and 40% debt the cost and availability of raising various amounts of new debt and equity capital is shown below what this is telling us is the following if a company raises up to 4 million then the cost of debt is 14% percent. 
If the company borrows more than 4 million, then the cost of debt goes up to 16%. In the equity market, if the company raises up to 9 million, the cost of equity is 20%. If the company raises more than 9 million, then the cost of equity is 22%. This is a very simple example, but it will illustrate the concept. What I want you to do is calculate the weighted average cost of capital for raising 5 million and then raising 10 million, 15 million, 20 million. Assume that we have this capital structure. And I'll just give you a hint to get you started. When a company raises 5 million, it is going to raise 60% from the equity market and 40% from the debt market. So your debt market is 40% of 5, which is going to be 2 million. Equity is going to be 3 million, which is 60% of 5. Notice that the debt is less than this cutoff. So what is the cost going to be? Cost of debt is going to be 14%. What about the cost of equity? We are less than this cutoff, so the cost of equity is going to be 20%. Going back to our original VAC formula, we also need to use the weightages. The weight of debt is 40%. So you have 14% multiplied by 0 0.4 and then you have 20 percent multiplied by 0 0.6 we are not doing a 1 minus t because we are given the after tax cost of debt use this to come up with the weighted average cost of capital for this amount then use the same method to come up with the numbers for raising 10 million, 15 million, and 20 million. And then I want you to fill out this picture. You are going to have 5 million, 10 million, 15, and 20, and you need to show the VAC for each of these numbers. When you raise 5 million, the cost of debt, based on the calculations we saw on the previous slide, equal 17 point. 6%. When the company raises 10 million, then debt is 4, equity is 6. Notice that 4 is right at the edge. So the cost of debt is still 4%, equity is 6. We are still less than this threshold. So the cost of capital, overall weighted average cost of capital, is still 17.6%. But if the company raises just a little more than 10, then notice that we will be borrowing more than 4 million. So we are now in this category. The cost of debt is now going to be 16%. Equity is still less than 9 million. So the cost of equity is still going to be 20%. The new cost of capital is 0.4 into 16 plus 0.6 into 20, which is 18.4. What is happening at the 10 million mark is that as we raise a little more than 10 million, our cost of capital jumps up to 18.4. If the company raises 15 million, then debt would be 6, equity 9. At 6, we have a cost of debt equal to 16%. At 9, we are just at the edge and cost of equity is 20%. So at 15, the cost of capital will still be 18.4. But as we raise a little more than 15, then the cost of debt remains the same because here we are already in the higher tier. But equity now will be in this category. We will be raising more than 9 million. The cost of equity then becomes 22%. And the overall cost of capital jumps up to 19.6%.
So as we go beyond 15 million, the cost of capital becomes 9.6. After that, the cost of capital stays 19.6 because we are in the higher category with both debt and equity. What we have created here is the marginal cost of capital schedule, which is showing us the weighted average cost of capital for different amounts of capital. Let us now summarize the main points, and these are quite testable, but first let us just reproduce the marginal cost of capital schedule. Here is what we came up with on the previous slide. Notice that as a firm raises more capital, the cost of different sources of finance will increase. And this makes sense. As a company tries to borrow more and more, riskiness goes up, so the cost of debt will go up. Similarly, as a company tries to raise more and more equity, the cost of equity goes up. That's why we have, that's why we have a marginal cost of capital schedule that is going upwards. In a earlier slide, we talked about a marginal cost of capital, which was a straight line. But realistically, a step function is what you are more likely to see. As we've discussed, the marginal cost of capital schedule shows the weighted average cost of capital for different amounts of capital or different amounts of financing. And finally, extremely important from an exam perspective is this concept of a breakpoint. The breakpoint is where the cost of capital changes. In our example, the two breakpoints are 10 and 15. What is a quick way of coming up with the breakpoints? The answer is right here. A breakpoint is equal to the following. Amount of capital at which the component cost of capital changes divided by the weight of the component in the capital structure. In our example, we have two components, debt and equity. Let's take the debt component first. What's the amount of capital at which the cost of debt changes answer is 4 at 4 million the cost of debt goes up from 14% to 16% that's the numerator divided by the weight of the component in the capital structure what's the weight of debt in the capital structure it is 40% or 0 0.4 4 divided by 0 0.4 is equal to 10 this 10 is where the cost of capital jumps up. So in the example earlier, I simply gave you the numbers. But if on an exam you are asked to calculate the breakpoints, then here is what you need to do. What about the second breakpoint? This increase is coming because of equity. So you look at the amount of equity at which the change occurs, and that is 9 million. You do 9 million divided by the weight of equity in the capital structure, which is 0 0.6. 9 divided by 0 0.6 is 15. And that's the number right here where the second breakpoint occurs. Again, this is quite important from an exam perspective, so make sure you understand this concept. Next, I will help you understand example 13. Over the years, students keep coming to me and asking me about this example. I will make you do it, but I will give you some basic information which will help you solve this problem. We are asked to calculate the weighted average cost of capital at different levels of debt. Different levels of debt would imply different capital structures. To compute the VAC, you need the cost of debt and the cost of equity. You calculate the cost of debt using borrowing rates in table 4. And in table 4, you are given the spreads over LIBOR for different levels of debt relative to capital. Capital is equal to debt plus equity. LIBOR is a interbank offer rate, and in this particular case, that LIBOR is simply given as 4.5%. As the company takes on more debt, 
the spread over LIBOR goes up and the, the cost of debt essentially is equal to LIBOR plus the spread. In our example, LIBOR is staying the same, but as the debt increases, this spread goes up. Therefore, the cost of debt goes up, which makes sense. More debt means more risk. More risk means that the cost of debt should be higher. The cost of debt part is fairly easy. The tougher part is calculating the cost of equity. And to do this, we have to compute the beta at different levels of debt. Now, how do we do this overall? The most basic way of coming up with cost of equity is to use the capital asset pricing model, which says that the cost of equity is equal to the risk-free rate plus beta times the equity risk premium. We are given the risk-free rate. We are given the equity risk premium. So we need to calculate the beta at different levels of debt. And as the level of debt goes up, we can expect the riskiness of the beta. We can expect the riskiness or the beta to also go up. So how do we calculate the beta at different levels of debt? We are given the unlevered or the asset beta and that number is 0 0.9. We are given the tax rate, which is 36%. Now, at different levels of debt, we have to calculate the equity beta. And this formula should look familiar from the discussion we had on the pure play model. Given a asset beta and the tax rate and the debt to equity ratio, you should be able to come up with the equity beta. But there is one little twist. The information provided tells us that the debt to capital ratio is 0.1 and then there are other debt to capital ratios. But if you can understand this, then you will be able to solve the rest of the problem. If you are given that the debt to capital ratio, and remember capital is the combination of debt and equity. If you are given this number and you are told this is 0.1, then what is debt to equity? This is actually simple mathematics. The way you can do this is as follows. Just pick some numbers for debt and equity that will give you a ratio of 0.1. If we say debt is 1 and equity is 9, then debt to capital will be 0.1. With debt 1 and equity 9, what's debt to equity? It is 1 over 9, which is equal to 0.11. So in your formula, you are going to use 0 0.11 for this situation. You can then come up with the equity beta, plug the equity beta into CAPM and calculate the cost of equity. Then you will have another situation where debt is higher and use the same method to come up with the cost of equity. Hopefully now when you do example 13, it will make a lot more sense. Flotation costs. Flotation costs are the fees charged by investment bankers when a company raises external capital. There are two approaches for dealing with flotation costs. The first approach, and this is, a, this is the approach that you might often see in finance textbooks, is to incorporate the flotation cost into the cost of capital. The basic formula for the cost of capital, assuming the Gordon growth model, is D1 over P0 plus the growth rate. Now, the assumption under approach one is that the flotation cost reduces the amount that we receive on a per share basis. That's why we subtract the flotation amount from the price. So this is the price that we receive per share. So effectively on a per share basis, we receive this much money. Notice that when we reduce this denominator, the value that we estimate for the cost of equity will go up. So the cost of equity with flotation cost will be higher than the cost of equity assuming no flotation costs. But there is an issue with this approach. The issue is 
that if we are discounting cash flows in the future using a relatively high discount rate, then the present value ends up being relatively low. So this is a bit of a problem, which is why the curriculum recommends approach two, which is to adjust cash flows. So we calculate the discount rate without taking flotation costs into account and simplistically assuming that we have a certain dividend which is growing at a constant perpetual rate and we can use the Gordon growth formula then we'll have this value for the cost of equity and then the cash flows are adjusted by the amount of the flotation cost. This way, any discounting that we do of future cash flows will be at an appropriate rate rather than at a higher discount rate. And as I mentioned earlier, this is the recommended approach. That brings us to the end of this reading. Let's summarize the main points. You need to understand the concept behind VAC. Weighted average cost of capital represents the cost of raising money. And since we are raising money from different sources, we need to take the weighted average of the cost associated with each source. You must know the calculation, which is cost of debt into one minus T times the weight of debt. And the weightage needs to be based on market values plus cost of equity cost of equity multiplied by the weight of equity. If you have preferred shares, then you also need to add the weight of preferred shares into the cost of preferred shares. We then talked about different ways of calculating the component costs. With cost of debt, we talked about the YTM approach and we have to use the financial calculator. With cost of preferred shares, the main point was that cost of preferred shares is equal to the preferred dividend divided by the current price of the preferred share. With cost of equity, we talked about three methods. You must know them very well. CAPM, and then we had the dividend discount model where we assumed perpetual growth. And then we talked about the bond yield plus a premium. Then we talked about these miscellaneous topics, the pure play method, the country risk premium, the marginal cost of capital schedule and the flotation costs. From an exam perspective, I would say that these items are the most important. As always, I would encourage you to read the summary, review the learning objectives. I have told you to do the examples. I think the examples in this reading are very good and they help you understand the concepts very well. Do the practice problems at the end of the reading and try to do practice problems from other sources as well.